I want to suggest that most of us are using AI a little bit backwards. Stay with me, this is worth it. We are using AI primarily for information compression. So take my meeting notes and turn them into really neat outputs. Take this large product requirements doc, turn it into this for engineers and this for my executive stakeholders. Take this 100 page PDF and turn it into something succinct. Take Nate's super long sub stack and make it into something I can digest. I kid you not, people do that. It's kind of hilarious. The point is we're using it to compress information. But something that I heard that's been really sticking with me is the idea that the brain doesn't process compressed information in the same way. And one of the things that we need to learn to think about is when do we want to tolerate less brain time on a subject versus when do we want to actually optimize our partnership with AI so we spend more brain time marinating in what really matters. So a lot of the learning that you get when you read a large book, a deep book on a big subject, it comes from your brain forming new connections as it spends extended time in the subject. If you get, and you can, a very short one-pager, you will get a precy, a summary, an executive briefing on the book. You are unlikely to have the kind of life-changing experience that you had if you really dipped into it. Now, there are people who will take that insight and say, wow, so AI is the problem. I actually think the way we use it is the problem. Not that it's bad to use it for compression. I too use it for adjusting my meeting notes. I too use it for sending different messages to different stakeholders for routine business communication. But if you need to do really deep thinking, you need to spend time on a subject, you need to optimize your cognitive workload to enable you to do your best thinking. And AI actually can really help with that. And I'll give you a specific example. I am contemplating writing a book on AI. Writing a book is a hard task. It's much harder, exponentially harder than a single article. It needs to be useful, especially with AI, some of the challenges in having something that stands the test of time, etc. And I find that when I'm co contemplating writing a book, the thing that is most difficult for me, it's not the information compression. It's not that I need it to go out and tell me all the news about AI. I already get plenty of news, trust me. It's that I need to work with AI in a way that helps my brain expand and kick around the subject matter. And we don't really optimize for that when we only talk about prompting, because prompting really optimizes for one-way communication. Learning how to prompt well is a skill, but it's sort of like learning to ride a bicycle versus learning to drive a car. Both are helpful. The car is going to take you farther if you learn how to do it well. And I think increasingly prompting is like the bicycle skill. It's incredibly efficient if you master it. Everybody should know how to do it. It should be a universal skill. I do think we're going to need it for a while. I think it provides a durable edge if you can ride well, if you can prompt well. And I love it. But if you can learn to actually cognitively partner beyond an individual prompt with AI, that's like driving a car. That's like actually going farther. And so in my case with the book, just to circle back, I spent 25 minutes in advanced voice mode talking with OpenAI. Uh, and it was, I think they use like a variant of their 4.0 model in advanced voice mode. And you might be waiting for me to say, I had the most profound insights. Like the AI really helped me. It's, it really wasn't that. In fact, I sometimes told it, this is really vanilla. I don't love this. What it was that was distinct and special was it was there when I needed to talk out loud. It would let me talk out loud for a while. It actually listened. It actually took notes and it actually responded with just enough interest, engagement and riffing to keep my brain flowing so I could keep the idea coming. Because I had an idea that I wanted to talk out, I knew I couldn't just dictate into a transcription device for 25 minutes and get it. But if I had someone talk back to me in the right cadence, 
I'd probably be able to fish it out of my brain because we're conversational people. And so a conversational AI was the right choice. In this case, advanced voice mode really has gotten better since they shipped uh, that update that makes it, you know, more aware of when it interrupts you. Uh, it uses more discontinuities verbally like uh and um. It just sounds more natural and it allows you to forget it's there and just focus on the subject, which is what I needed to do. That's just step one. I did the verbal piece. And then the second piece was I really needed to wrestle with what the terrain of the idea looked like. And I knew 4.0 wasn't strong enough to do it. And so instead of trying to force it inside that conversation, I literally pulled the transcript out into a Google Doc and I stuck it into 03 as a raw transcript. And I said, this is a transcript. This is my perspective on the transcript. This was the intent I had with this idea. Really, this is where I iteratively arrived uh, because I find that a lot of time when you're talking out loud, you're sort of naming the work as you go. And that's part of the cognitive journey that we've kept inside our heads for 200,000 years. And now we have a partner to do it with. And it's true that like sometimes if you did paired work together with humans, you could kind of get to this. But I actually think it's a distinct dynamic with AI. I have not worked and I have I, I worked in offices, right? I've worked in person with teams. I love that dynamic. I don't want it to go away when we work well together with with good human colleagues. But it's not the same as a good AI colleague, an AI colleague that you can brainstorm with in that way where they listen and just riff with you. It's like this crossover between the way a therapist listens to you and the way a colleague listens to you. And you'd never expect a human to do that, but it's super helpful for your thinking. So we do that. We name the work. We get to O3 through the Google Doc. O3, and honestly, it's not just O3. I don't want to just rep OpenAI here, right? Like you can go and do this in Opus, uh, the Claude model, Opus 4. You could do this in Gemini 2.5 Pro. You get similar results. The idea is you want to think deeply and critique the model results that you get from the 4.0 conversation. Basically, take my intent, take what I was able to articulate, take the riffing that advanced voice mode did, and help me get to a crystal clear understanding of the heart of the idea. That's what you want in the next step. It's basically help me to define the coordinates of the terrain that I'm in now that I've named the work. And once we do that, the sky becomes the limit. We can open up to understanding what are the partnership dynamics that work from here. So as a specific example, I thought O3 did a good job getting to the heart of the thesis for the book. I thought the outline felt a little bit heavy. I need to go into a different model. I'll probably choose Opus 4 for this to start to refine what that looks like a little bit more. I need to pick a different cognitive partner. And if you're wondering, how do I pick models? I put a whole thing up on Substack on how I sort of pick models for different tasks. Um, to me, I think the piece that I keep coming back to, stepping back, reflecting on all of this, is that I find the most value. Like, this is real expense, right? Like, I, I'm, I'm a pro subscriber to OpenAI, right? Like, I pay my 200 bucks a month. Not everybody has to. I don't think you have to to get a ton of value out of it. I saw the article that said is free so good that you don't need plus. I think for a lot of people it is. But for me, whatever whatever your investment level is in AI, the value you get is so much greater if you use it in this way as a way of getting your brain time on subject, optimizing for time on subject versus optimizing for just compressing and repurposing information. Most of the use cases I see from companies, if they are not super fluent in AI, end up being around compressing and repurposing information, which is fine. There are some cost savings there, but helping your brain work better has a lot more upside over time. And I think we talk about it a whole lot less. And I wish we would talk about it more. I wish we would not get so far into the compression trap that we don't think about this idea that AI can help us map and expand the cognitive territory that we work in by partnering with us in a way that is 
you know, somewhat reminiscent of what we would do with a human, but also distinct. I, I also, you know, just as I said, I wouldn't ask a human to do the kind of listening that I asked advanced voice mode to do. I also wouldn't really ask a human to work on sharpening my thesis for an outline the way I would ask O3 to do it. I wouldn't ask a human to go and like necessarily do the research and do the thinking um, and the, for lack of a better term, cognitive shaping on the thesis with me. It's not just doing it on its own that I would ask of Opus 4. Opus 4 is great for shaping ideas and really thinking through concepts. And so I'm finding in a sense that my brain is able to think better by spending more time with AI models if they're carefully modulated. It's not just throwing prompts in there. There's no secret prompt to this. It's deciding the kind of task I need and then making sure that I approach AI and ask myself, what is the model that I can choose that will most help me to optimize for getting my brain deeply into the subject matter so that I become someone who truly understands it? That in and of itself is opposed to, it's antithetical to this idea that AI lets you go cheap on your brain, right? It lets you skip the brain power. It lets you not do the work. It lets you read the one page or not the full book. I don't think it has to. I think it can actually help you to think better. I find it does, but it's how you use it. And it's not that to say at all that like, again, I started this by saying I use the compression stuff too. I think we all do. We all will. It helps us save time. It's about knowing when to sort of pull the thinking button and say, I want to use this to actually expand my time thinking about this because this is really important. This is work that needs and deserves the cream of my brain. And I need to orient my approach to AI so that I can spend more time marinating on this in a way that works for my brain. And part of why there's no magic prompt for this is our brains are wired pretty uniquely. The way I choose to like walk around and talk and like talk my ideas out loud may not work for everybody. There are people for whom they need to write it out by hand, take a picture of it, get a transcription, and maybe that's the way they start. Um, I think your mileage is going to vary because your brain varies, but the concept of optimizing for having your brain in the subject is something that allows us to view AI as an expander, not just as a compression tool. It's something that optimizes for what we can create, not just how we can cut costs by compressing information, even if that's useful. So thinking about this was helpful for me. I hope it kind of turns the wheels for you, maybe helps you think about AI a bit differently. And try out advanced voice mode. It's fun.